We have an amazing group here before us, and now it's time to hear about their businesses. Each entrepreneur will have one minute to make their business presentation to the Sharks. The Sharks will then in turn have five minutes to ask them questions. So let's get started. Let's roll. Aja, you're up first. My name is Aja. Um, the company I co-founded is called FreePing, and FreePing is a platform, a content distribution platform that allows anyone in the world with a mobile phone to access information for free without using any uh, calling minutes, any texting, any data. There's no external app, and it works on any phone in the world, regardless of handset um, and operating system. And the way that we're able to deliver on the promise of uh, free content um, is by connecting what's called a missed call or flashing, um, as we sort of talked about backstage, with um, as an activation mechanism for incoming content. Um, we prioritize the feature phone uh, prepaid mobile user in emerging markets, and we partner with organizations to deliver uh, utility information um, to empower people's daily lives, like real-time bus schedules, uh, market conditions for farmers so they can know where to sell their crops, um, and information that we believe will empower uh, people to use their phones to you know, introduce them to the, uh, emo the uh, information revolution. That's it. So you're ready? <laughs> ready as always. Um, so explain to me a little bit more. So when a call comes in and it flashes, mm -hmm. then that is when there's an opportunity for the caller to receive information. Absolutely. And, so, that, and so, but okay. So just want to make sure I understand that. Um, but in terms of cost. Are you using an ad, or how are you paying down the mobile telecom company so that there's no charge for the call? Right, so the way the platform works for the end user, um, the missed call is free uh, to the organization, and then that missed call triggers an incoming SMS, um, which is also free to the end user. Um, the organization, we monetize in a couple of different ways. So are those, it's free because you're paying for it externally, so that, but the telecom company isn't giving it to you for free? Right, exactly. We're paying okay. for it externally. Okay. So I call, um, it's a missed call, um, then I get an SMS back with information that they, other, that they were trying to get, right? Correct. It's a cool idea, and then you sell ads and everything around it in order to be able to monetize and make money. Right, we sell ads, and we also give organizations full dexterity with the platform um, as a subscription model. How successful have you been selling the ads? We have, oh, so we're just starting out. Um, we've been developing the platform for a few months. Uh, we'll be piloting this in, uh, or we are piloting this in three different markets um, with about a reach of three million mobile users. Um, so we haven't reached critical mass yet to sell the ads quite yet. Um, we're going to start first with partnering with organizations who will pay a subscription model. And do you have any of those organizations in hand? We do. So we are working with a few uh, at the moment. And which markets are you in right now? We're in Brazil, uh, Kenya, and South Africa. Now, what type of content do you put out there? Is it, is it educational content or any kind of content? It's really any content. So there are social and commercial applications for free ping. Um, what we would like to, the kind of content that we will um, provide as sort of our proprietary streams will be utility information. So educational information, um, everyday life information, um, value-added services for mobile phones. And but the other content is due to the advertisers. It is, right. uh, okay. brands or Because you're concentrating on STEM, correct? Correct. Was your initial goal to help people or right. was it to make money? The initial goal was to help people. So my background is in economics, policy, and development with a focus on um, how people use their cell phones to organize um, social movements. Um, so my heart is in um, allowing people to use the tool that they have um, to eliminate sort of whatever barriers that you know, can be eliminated to organize people for you know, any sort of social purpose. I'm curious what triggered that desire in the first place. It's some, do you have some life event that made you think that way? Well, I mean, I do have a pretty humble background. Um, I come from sort of meager beginnings. I, you know, have stumbled along the way on my journey. I've, you know, really benefited from um, access to a lot of different resources. So it's it's just been my identification with these sorts of sort of marginal groups that's really kind of um, propelled me in the direction to help these people. Does the end user consciously sign up for this, or this is automatically something that when they purchase the device, it's it's embedded in the device? It's in uh, they consciously subscribe. 
And what's the reason? Why would they subscribe to this? What is, it, what is the benefit for them? The benefit for them is that it's information that they are currently paying five, or around $5 a, a week for, um, that we eliminate the paywall to. How many people do you have paying $5 a week? Uh, we don't have and anyone yeah. paying oh, that. Oh, pilot. Pilot. Yeah. Right. It's five dollars a week, typically with the mobile carriers. So we provide the information for free. It's a great idea. I yeah, mean, it, it, is, it sounds like things are going. I think you're in the right markets where um, smartphones are are just taking off, and people are looking for new ways and less expensive ways to use it because it gets to be very expensive. Um, and if you're able to create this as a platform, obviously from Facebook and other applications, they're looking at launching points to be able to extend their apps. And so I, I think. It's great. Thank you. Me too. Thank Same you. here. And we understand you, you don't want our money today, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, we can talk. We can talk. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, Thank you. Thank you. you. My name is Ziad Sankari, I'm from Lebanon, and I'm the founder of Cardio Diagnostics. Cardio Diagnostics is a medical technology company that is founded on a very ambitious vision of making heart problems no more the leading cause of death around the world. And we aspire to do that by leveraging the power of wearable devices and cloud computing uh, to help users lead a better and longer and healthier life. Today we have FDA approved devices that are wearable, connected to your body. They uh, measure your heart signal 24 seven. When they detect an abnormality, they would automatically transmit the data through the internet to a dedicated monitoring center where professional medical experts are gonna look at the data and take the necessary measure, measure to save the patient if necessary. Uh, in certain condition in, in our pilot launch, we uh, caught uh, events where the patient was experiencing a lethal condition and his life was, his or her life was literally saved due to our technology. Uh, we aspire to create um, more sophisticated technology that are not only limited to uh, prescription only, we want to create it for the general audience for them to lead a healthier and longer life. Can you tell us about the device itself? Sure, so uh, we manufacture with different manufacturers. Uh, the devices are wearable, they could be placed okay. in a pocket. Uh, 150 uh, grams, uh, they are smaller than the iPhone size, right. uh, a bit thicker, uh, they run on batteries, the different so, models. And so what do you wear around your chest? So there are three sensors attached to the body that collect the electrocardiogram or the heart signal, right. and those devices would analyze it and detect abnormality. And you expect people to wear those full time all the time? Uh, so. Typically, they wear it for up to 30 days because this is enough to know if there's a problem ongoing or not. And our, we're introducing new wearable technology that is much less intrusive and that could be long, uh, worn for much longer. And so this is used by doctors in response to um, at-risk patients as opposed to a healthy population or is it a healthy population you're looking to attract? Today, we are prescription only by physicians to diagnose problems. We are developing technology for the wider audience okay. to prevent and, and what, what's your secret sauce? Because there are a lot of heart, heart monitors. Sure. The, the sensors that are able to do that are decreasing in size and price rapidly. Sure. Um, I've got a company that we use for the Mavericks, right? Just being able to track heart rate during extreme exercise and looking for anomalies. So how, what's going to happen when it's mainstream and these sensors are available you know, for anybody at any point in time or if you know, a watch? is able to calculate it from, from your pulse? That's a great question, because our secret sauce is not on the hardware side at all. We leverage the power of uh, cloud computing. We, uh, we have proprietary technology that analyzes the data, automatically detects okay, what, problems. What makes you, okay, because everybody's got cloud computing, right? Sure. That's not a differentiator. What is it, what is your secret sauce in special terms of Special algorithms, data? that special algorithms that are capable of detecting problems, and special algorithm that can make sense out of the data and provide it to the user and tell him what problems problem is underlying in that Is case. it going just to the user or is it is it going immediately to the professional who is saying you need to come in because we're seeing some you know some issues? The way we are set up today it goes to the professional not to the user but we're targeting younger population for prevention so that's when it will go to the user eventually. How much does the unit sell for? The unit is it, the user does not buy it here rent it from the hospital. It's a prescription, correct? Sure. Right, but what what does it cost the hospital? What does it cost the insurance company? A couple of thousand dollars to purchase the unit for the hospital. That's, that's awful expensive. They yeah. actually the reimbursement rate here in the US is seven hundred fifty to eight hundred dollars per use. So when you, the patient wears it for like thirty days, they get reimbursed eight hundred dollars. And how are you getting the education out to the doctors that this exists instead of them prescribing something different? The doctors do know that there is a problem. 
in, in the market where they need to monitor patients for long periods of time. Yeah, they understand they that. Yeah, but how do they find you? Oh, they, how have they been finding you? The channels. So basically, we go through our manufacturers who have very strong relationships in the market. So far, we've been limited in our channels and through our website, basically. Do you think you could bring the device to the point where it's simply a patch that could be put on a healthy patient? Could it be that slim? I'm having a hard time visualizing. Well, Mark, is saying, Mark is saying it will maybe even get down to a watch. Or even smaller. But is there wires that connect those three patches on the chest to the device in the pocket? I just can't picture Actually, it. Actually, that's exactly where we're going. And we're, uh, I mean, that's, you're forcing us to announce that that's this is coming you pretty soon. That's genius. Oh, yeah, that's exactly. Great. Now this is the IP being generated. <laughs> we are that's why she's a shark. <laughs> I think it's an amazing idea. I'm waiting for the commercial one when you you know you're concerned about somebody's health and 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 let them start to see actually the. But but the thing. challenge yeah, is you're seeing a ton of competition here, right? I mean, it, it, there there there's a lot of competition in this space, and sensors are, you know, becoming more and more. Um, prescriptive and, and more sensitive, mm -hmm. right? And and so it, it's it's a great idea. Um, but your algorithms are going to have to be really, really, really good because there's a lot of smart people trying to do the exact same thing. True, and that's why I'm, I'm the, the team, we have people with PhDs. I'm myself, I'm trained on signal processing. Um, all my research was on detecting those things. And uh, our secret sauce is basically trying to make sense out of the data, not good. using the sensor. So then, then really, if your secret sauce is then, you know, you don't have to be in the hardware business. You don't no. have to. You can be just. I don't in like the, the hardware business. Got to be it. Okay, so you're just doing this proof of concept to get to educate people. You should just say you're smarter sense. than everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Anything else, Barb? Clear. Thank All you. right. Thank you. Congrats. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Felipe Gomez Ocampo. I'm the founder and the CEO of FGC Plasma Solutions, and I'm here to tell you that the next big thing in aerospace is actually small. And I can do that thanks to my redesigned Galdi fuel nozzle, which uses plasma to make flying safer and more efficient. So this is important because as it stands right now in the aerospace industry, fuel makes up an airline's largest operating expense. And emissions from both gas turbines and jet engines contribute to everything from global warming to ozone layer depletion. So we're here talking about starting the spark, and this is actually what we're doing inside of the jet engine, uh, with, a net, with the, a net effect of an up to 10% decrease in fuel consumption and 25% decrease in emissions. There's a large push in the aviation industry to be carbon neutral by 2020 and half CO2 emissions by 2050, and we intend to be part of this. <laughs> That's it? Yeah. More cool. questions. Is this a, uh, so explain this, this device and, and not, <laughs> and it. not technical, you know, just right. uh, it, it is a, it is a, uh, engine itself? It, no, so we are a retrofit or for, for the engine, right? So it's a, right. it's the part that actually sprays fuel into the engine. It's a pretty small part. It's a pretty small part. Um, it's installed during routine, ma routine maintenance. Understood. It's kind of like a fuel injector or spark. Could I think of it as a hose? Like a fuel injector. Oh, it's a fuel injector, fuel like injector. a car. Yeah. Like, a, like a shower head, more like, but yeah. <laughs> And so where, where are you in your life cycle? Are people buying it yet? Are you productized yet or in, in process? No, we're still working on, uh, on the development of it. So the, the development cycle is fairly long because you want to make sure it's not going to break if somebody's flying on it. Um, so it's, it's around at, you know, at least a four to five year development cycle, depending on how much involvement we get with an OEM. Shouldn't it apply to other types of engines as well that you can experiment on? Uh, yeah, we're planning to go into gas turbines, which are jet engines that are used to generate but, power. But I mean, I'm talking, you know, lawn mowers. <laughs> Not, not as much, no. So there's, there's some space in the industrial furnace side, but we're really targeting uh, gas turbines first. That's our pain point. Do you have a lot of smart kids like you working with you? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we're, we're working on it. So thankfully, at Case, I'm connected to some great resources, and we just got a grant from the Department of Energy, so we're focused on expanding and adding some more talent. And all the money is going to development. How are you going to sell it once it's made? So we, this isn't something that we intend to manufacture, right? So we intend to partner, do a joint venture with one of the major uh, engine OEMs because it, it's going to be really difficult to outcompete them. So sure. essentially what Good we idea. need to do is, is just get in the door with them and then uh, we'll work and together. And do a collaboration or a license or something of that nature, right? Exactly. So probably like a joint development program with an option on the outcome. Could you so, get a guy, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Could you get a guy with like a big mustache to help you sell it at the time when it gets ready? I, 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 will, uh, I will put that down. <laughs> that would probably help. Yeah, no mustache, no chance, right? <laughs> where, where have you done these studies that say that it will increase 25% uh, emissions and 10%? It's all been done at Case, and then we're working with uh, NASA Glenn in Cleveland, which is one of the only places in the world where you can further test these components. So you have a lot of personal decisions to make, right? Because you're a junior in school. I am. Yeah. And, and so going through the process of staying in school, 
right? Um, some people would say that maybe you shouldn't stay in school. Where, where, where's your head at? At least for me, due to the highly technical nature of this product, there's a lot of value in being School. attached to a, to a research institution, right? So I'm actually probably going to turn this into a PhD thesis and get two birds with one stone. So you're going to go to school even more? Probably. Yeah. <laughs> Utilize all those resources, right? Right. There, there's, there's a lot of so you're paying So you're paying them in order for them to leverage your amazing idea. Actually, I have a full scholarship, so I'm not paying. Oh, there you go. Okay. Yeah, so I'm, I'm good. <laughs> good. My faith is restored. <laughs> Congrats, man. That's amazing. Thank you, man. I, love, I love the objective. OK, so hi, everyone. Um, imagine a woman giving birth on bare floor. And imagine a midwife using her mouth to suck out mucus from the nurseries of a newborn. Or even imagine a birth attendant severing the umbilical cord of a newborn with a rusty bleed. Now, that's the problem faced by over 60% of women in rural communities in Nigeria. My name is Adekwe Jijayova. I run Mother's Delivery Kits in Nigeria. We work to connect women in rural communities to the life-saving supplies they need at childbirth. So we have this kit that contains about 15 sterile supplies and costs $5, which is about the cost of um, a double cheeseburger and fries here. You know, <laughs> and then what we do is we connect these women in rural communities, provide them with these sterile supplies at the cost of $5. At the moment, we have 18,000 women and children birthed with our kids. And then we have 80 midwives and birth attendants who are enrolled as our agents in different rural communities. We believe that the location of a woman at childbirth should never be an excuse to let her die. Mother's Delivery Kit is working hard to keep this promise. Thank you. Wow. Can you give us a better idea what the life-saving supply looks like that you're giving to these women? Okay, so the life-saving supplies contains a delivery mat, an infant receiver. It contains mucus extractor to prevent birth asphyxia. It contains scalpel blades. It contains the gauze. It contains mentholated spirit disinfectant with chlorexidil for cord care. It contains antiseptic soap, just basic things that a woman needs for a childbirth, but accessibility is a major problem in rural communities. Mm -hmm. so, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say, are you selling these or just providing them? We're selling this at the cost of $5. Oh, and and the communities, um, and who's, are the hospitals buying them? Or you're, you're training midwives in each community um, because they don't have hospitals, I'm guessing. And so how are you, you said you have a, um, a network of yes. 80 midwives. Yes. How are you training them? How are you reaching them? Um, and can, $5 is, you know, maybe a lot of money to them. So how are they able to afford it? Okay, so what happens is we have a contribution scheme in most of the better attendants, women, traditional better attendants, where a woman, in the course of her antenatal, the four or five visits she has, drops like contributes a dollar towards the usage of this kit at childbirth. And then we have these uh, midwives in different communities. Midwives are not present in every community. So in some communities, we have to train traditional better attendants and upgrade them into community extension workers, train them extensively, and link them up with skilled birth attendants to be able to effectively identify complications at childbirth and then refer immediately complication arises. So your challenge then is more reaching people because the product has obvious value and the cost has obvious value, right? Mm -hmm. Have you partnered with any other organizations or are there other organizations that go into the same raw communities for other services, other products um, that can maybe extend your reach and get you there more quickly? Absolutely. We can't be everywhere. At the same time, we recognize that we are a growing organization. We have, for instance, partnered with the um, Global Rights um, International in Nigeria who are working with internally displaced people in okay. um, northern Nigeria, displaced people by Boko Haram. And so we have a partnership going where we are able to provide maternal and child health care for those internally displaced people. Similarly, for other areas in Nigeria, we have other smaller organizations who have deep reach and are well trusted. But I get working with other nonprofits, right? Mm -hmm. But are there any other types? I, what I'm looking for is our leverage points, okay. right? Because the difficulty is in reaching as many women as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. and, when, and obviously, I'm not familiar, but if there's not even midwives mm -hmm. in each of these 
these communities, are there other organizations, for-profit or non-profit, that on an ongoing basis have already have the means or are in place to go visit these communities? Absolutely. You have the primary health care centers, which is run by the government. Primary health care centers, health care centers are the closest to the people in different so rural are, communities. So are those organizations, have you been able to partner with them, or are Absolutely. they resistant? Yes. That's what the midwives are. They run the primary health care centers. Got it. Okay. Is there any resistance on the part of the mother? On the part oh, of the mother, very welcome. no, it's, yeah, no yeah, yeah. It's, it's difficult to even find any resistance because when you see death staring you in the face seriously, you can't have any resistance to that. That's amazing. That's yeah. Yeah. Remarkable. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're a, great, a very fervent uh, believer and you express it so well. It's a great compliment to you. Thank you. So we haven't picked on anybody yet, so. <laughs> <Here's a little. laughs> I won't be that lucky. We haven't he found has, anybody like Barbara to pick on yet. No, don't worry about it. I've uh, never seen him pick on a pretty girl. Uh, <laughs> yes, you have. Thank you. Yes, you have. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm an equal opportunity jerk, so it's all right. Uh, okay, that's good. So, hi, my name is Jimena Flores. I'm from Colombia. I'm the CEO of Crispy Fruits. Crispy Fruits um, research, design, and develop healthy food snacks at the same time that we help the small farmers, farmers to go out of the poverty. Our products are sold in around 500 channels, and 1,000 of those channels are uh, nutritionists that play a, a really big role for us as a key uh, distribution channel and um, give us a uh, bill. Our, help us to build um, brand awareness and uh, as well to track people's health. And uh, at the same time, well, we, we empower small farmers transfer by purchasing their food and by transferring knowledge and technology and by finding resources like funds uh, in form of investments to assure that their projects can be sustainable. Right now, we are supporting cacao farmers in Colombia from the poorest areas of my country. And um, we are helping them. We are impacting around 5,000 people, 1,000 families growing cacao. And they have already $1 million business, but they are still living under poverty. So what we do is helping them to grow sustainable and to find investors and to find funds and open from their markets and transferring uh, technology and knowledge to grow that sustainable. Shamina, mm -hmm. you said your distribution channel is 500 nutritionalists. Is that your only means of distributing the product? No, 500 channels, what we mean is 100 is nutritionist. And the other, we focus in one channel, is vending machines that sells into the multinationals that have already wellness department and work together with their employers to, to be better, in, to be healthy. So that's why for us, at the beginning, when we tried to enter into the market, we were looking then it retails, but it was very difficult because of, of the money. When you go to the new product, a new brand in retail, you have to spend uh, a lot of money trying to build a brand awareness. So you get into the vending machines per se, in a way they're a smaller version of the retail store. Yes, it's a small version, and it's very interesting because, uh, well, they, they have like the, the customers where they sell, the, I pick the ones that sell into that uh, multina uh, multinationals or firms where they have the wellness department. So not all the vending machines have healthy products. So it was a great opportunity to be the one, the only one healthy product in one vending machine. Mm -hmm. What makes this healthy? Uh, well, my, I have... Um, and they're good. I've had try. some. They're really yes. good. <laughs> but is it, is, it, is it organic? or is What it makes just it healthy? Because, because it's just fruit. Okay. Healthy, 100% uh, natural fruit. We don't add sugar. We don't need any preservative, any conservative. It's just the fruit. But in regards to raising it, are there still pesticides? and? Well, the fruit that we're using now is Global Gap. Okay. We don't have organic. That's something that uh, we are working in Colombia to develop more organic food and to uh, help the farmers to know what is organic. Because uh, what happens in Colombia is not the farmers don't know what is the benefit of growing organic food and having fair trade uh, programs. That's why we are doing as well as a firm, because we want to assure to the customers better pro products, healthier products, and sustainability for the farmers. What's, what needs to happen at the farm level level for a farm to start producing for you? 
uh, well, they, I, ha I already buy fruit from them and uh, cacao from the other farmers from my new products. And, uh, but what happens now, for me, I'm buying now. But what I want is to let them export the, fr the fruit or change uh, into the industry different products. For example, in cacao, especially uh, for the cacao farmers, I'm trying to, I'm helping them to, to get technology to transform cacao beans into cocoa powder and into butter cocoa. We know now that the cacao is, the demand is growing and the offer is uh, getting down because of the soil in Africa. They're having a lot of problems growing cacao because of the weather. So it's a great opportunity. That sounds like an expensive proposition to provide the technology for them to convert that way. Yes. Is there profit built into your product or is it intended to help the farmer and help the Both. consumer but not be profitable? Both. I'm, I try to develop a business model where it can be profitable. And uh, so I include the farmers uh, bringing their resources, the food and the land. Then I found an investor. For example, this, this project is it, uh, the revenues is $1 million annually, and they're still poor. Mm -hmm. So what I did is, OK, they have a really, really big source of income and, and a product. Then I include an investor that, wants, uh, that is willing to give some money to make it grow as a business. And then my firm, what is taking a little part, looking for open markets for the farmers, giving uh, to the farmers knowledge to grow food and all So you together. act as a broker in a lot of respects. Yes. Got it. Okay. But, but not as a broker because I include the farmers in the Into, right, trade. So, right. Yeah, you're more vertically um, integrated, so everybody exactly. benefits from it. No, that's Ex great. Everybody benefits. So what happens usually with this kind of uh, crops <laughs> is that people or small farmers, if they get funds from the government, sometimes the funds get they, they spend all the funds and then what? So what we need is, uh, or what we are doing is, we find the investor, the investor stay there as a, another shareholder and help the farmers grow together and sustainable. And we gain as well like and that. And how well we have you done with getting investors? Sorry? How well have you done with? Really well. Uh, well, now I have two that wants to invest in, in the cacao, yes. So in the from, cacao. A, from a simple aspect, the farmers were basically uh, doing all the work and then giving over the product at the most the the, the, the lowest cost and not price. benefiting off of that. And now you and the investors are helping them not only sell to the businesses but sell to the end consumer, and it raises the the profits. The profits. The profits. And, and you share yes. them with everybody. Share exactly, with everybody. they share it with everybody, and they transform agricultural products like cocoa beans into cocoa powder and butter cocoa. So you're expanding them to make them more exactly. profitable, right, because they didn't have money to invest before. To invest before. They don't even have money to pay for capital, for working capital resources. They, right. So that's, that's awesome. Machinery Otherwise, it won't be sustainable. Good. good for you. That's awesome. Good for you. Congrats. Good for you. A lot of work. All right. It is a lot ladies, of work. Congrats. Yeah. Ladies and Thank gentlemen, a big hand to our five presenters. It restores our faith in the future. Thank you so much. And I love the impact of each of these uh, concepts and ideas. We wish you Godspeed and success. But while you're here, we know that uh, each of you has come here with a US federal program. Would each of you, maybe starting again with Aisha, could you please uh, walk through and tell us a little bit about the program that you are accompanied by? Sure, so I've been supported by two uh, US federal programs. Um, the incubator where my company is a resident, uh, Peninsula Technology Incubator is a recipient of the Small Business Administration Grant. Um, and also I received a Foreign Languages and Area Studies Fellowship um, to study again the confluence of mobile technologies and social movements um, and really to, develop, to, to sort of interface with a lot of different mentors and resources that I otherwise honestly don't believe that I uh, would have interacted with. So it's these human collisions that these uh, programs have afforded me and also um, a diverse background in a lot of different subjects. Did you hear she said SBA grant? All right, I heard that. <laughs> Congratulations, thank you. All right, and then moving on down, go ahead. Yes, please. Sure, so I'm also supported by two programs. The first one was the Fulbright's program that formally introduced me to the concept of entrepreneurship in a formal sense. Uh, I got a Fulbright scholarship to support my education at Ohio State University where I got involved in my first technology startup and that had a successful exit. Um, 
the second program uh, that also boosted the current startup I'm working on is the Global Innovation Through Science and Technology, the GIST initiative. That is a U U.S. Department of State initiative, and it helped me uh, st uh, start with seed funding for cardiodiagnostics. It also introduced me to the Silicon Valley mentors and um, network that I'm currently connected to, and also gave me access to a lot of opportunity. But probably the most important part has been uh, the mind-changing effect that it had on going big and going global that that initiative helped me with. Very nice. Felipe? Sure, so I've been involved with the uh, National Clean Energy Business Plan Competition run by the Department of Energy and administered by, by uh, Clean Energy Trust. So they gave me a $100,000 investment in two separate prizes, which is great because that sort of high-risk capital is what you need uh, developing new technologies in, in energy or in aerospace, and it's, it's hard to get uh, from other sources. As well, they've provided a lot of mentorship, which is uh, critical. I've learned that there's some things that you can't find on Google, and that's what mentors are for. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they've essentially helped me to take my technology out of the lab and make it a viable business. Very nice. Okay. Ari Piju? Yeah. Okay, so I've been supported by the Young African Leaders Initiative. I was part of the first cohort um, last June, and for me, it gave me the opportunity to have um, crash courses in business from the business and entrepreneurship track at the University of Texas, and I was also able to gain vital experience in global health, working and interning with the UN Foundation here in Washington. Thereafter, I moved on to get um, a United States, a USADF, United States African Development Foundation grant of $25,000 to support our expansion in Nigeria. But I think importantly for me in Yali, the support is from within the fellows, the over the about 500 fellows who came in from different African countries, building collaborations and partnership with them. We are starting four steps of expanding to Ghana, and that is with another Yali fellow who is a doctor in Ghana. And we are also building a technology platform with another Yali fellow from Cote d'Ivoire. So for me, it's, it's been amazing ride. Uh, well, I'm involved in uh, We Americas. We Americas is an initiative from the government of uh, the United States and help us to uh, get knowledge, funds, and uh, as well open markets. I had the opportunity to get to know in and with the partnership with We Connect International that I'm part with. Uh, to get to know um, buy, uh, buyers from from different retail stores here in the United States, like Walmart, and uh, Walmart is uh, opening an initiative uh, trying to include in, uh, women into the supply chain. So it's given me a lot of market opportunities, and as well in Colombia, I'm part of the um, organization called Andy, and in, I'm under a program. Uh, from MIT New York, I got that program, and it helps me with mentors from the presidents of companies, and my mentors are president of uh, DuPont in Colombia, Bimbo, Colombia, and ex-president of Monsanto. Very nice. Thank Give you. it up for our emerging entrepreneurs. And now we get to ask the shark some questions. <laughs> this is going to be good. Um, let's go ahead and start with Damon. Mind. Damon, you've had some ups and downs. You've had an incredible journey. You invested with your mother, put up some collateral, your own home. Introduce you've now uh, traversed a quite an important journey. Could you share with us what you learned? What you know, you have lots of young people here. What would be the most sage advice that you could offer them based on your experiences? Um, well, the first advice is um, uh, listen to your mother. I mean, there she is right there. Mom, wanted to stand up for a little while? Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so the couple of things that I've learned um, coming up was that, uh, first of all, there's uh, nothing that, um, that beats real world experience. Of course, I believe that uh, you should get an education. I believe that the understanding of how to be, have financial intelligence is very important. Um, so often kids ask, should, uh, should we ever go to school? I do believe that the basics of business, the fundamentals, and having a, a, a good amount of financial intelligence is very important. Apply that then to real world experience, blood, sweat, and tears. Um, I've learned also that you start off and just take affordable next steps. You don't wait for time to be perfect. You just make perfect use of time. And you go out, and a true entrepreneur, what they do is they take a step forward, they learn, and then they repeat. 
and they just keep going forward and don't go out and risk the whole farm like uh, you know I did with my mother the first day. That was really 10 years into the business and I had actually closed FUBU three times prior to that because of running out of capital. But I truly loved what I was doing and I was ready to dress somebody for the rest of their lives for free if I could because I was absolutely obsessed with what I did. So to sum that all up is first have some level of financial intelligence. Second of all, make sure that you take affordable next steps so if you fail, fail small. And then third of all, be obsessed and really love what you do. Every, every successful person in the world loves what they do and success is not money. Money just drives you up to your problems in a limousine. Success is <laughs> doing what you want and saving people and doing what you want every day. Thank you, thank you. Barbara, the same question. Mm -hmm. Would you repeat the question, ma'am? She wasn't listening to anything <laughs> I said. <laughs> um, no, but I want to say something first. I want to say that Damon's mother negotiated his deal to sell FUBU to get the partners in. Hmm. She went in that room and negotiated for this poor guy for him. <laughs> so stand up and take another bow, because you really deserve it. That's so Barbara. <laughs> All right, I just remember the question. That was a stall, but you got the credit. Okay. <laughs> I think for me, uh, probably the most um, the interesting thing I learned over time building my own business was that I never really did anything really spectacular until all the chips were down. I've since learned by investing in so many different young entrepreneurs on Shark Tank, uh, that is a singular trait I'm always looking for, that commonality that I have with them. How good are they when the chips are down? You know, a miracle happens on Shark Tank night. Even if it's a half-baked business, honest to God, they get a lot of sales because they've been put front and center in primetime TV. So you can imagine, they're found overnight. They're a Hollywood star. But watch that entrepreneur six months out when they take the bad turn, when they're misguided by someone, they're moaning and groaning. And the minute I hear the moaning and groaning, the oh, poor me, oh, poor me, I mentally check out on that entrepreneur because I've really learned over the years the really good ones are always good when the chips are down. They just reinvent themselves again and again. And so that's been the trait, the singular great trait that I'm always looking for. And I happen to have been lucky enough uh, through the school of, what did you call it? Not hard knocks, you said. Street, whatever your, what was your expression? Street smarts. Real life experience. Real, well, it was fancier than that. <laughs> but I've learned that uh, most everything uh, you learn in the street when the chips are down. Builds great character and gets you to be very resourceful. That's it. Resiliency. Please thank Barbara thank for a good advice. Damon said he calls it the power of broke. That's <laughs> a good one. Mark? Good one. You know, everybody in this room, everybody across this country um, in particular, always has that idea. You know that idea, and then you get that feeling in your stomach, and you're all fired up, and you tell your friends, and everybody goes, oh, that's a great idea. And then you search on Google, oh, I didn't see anything. Oh, this could be it. <laughs> <laughs> ready. And then a week later, I say, what were we talking about? You know, most people, everybody has ideas. Most people are afraid to take those first steps. Yes. Most people are afraid to do the work that's involved to be prepared to take those first steps. Ideas are easy. Even taking that first step isn't all that difficult. What's hard is doing the work. Being prepared, because one thing I can tell you, no matter what, what business you start, if it's a great business, there's a good chance I'm going to be going after you, right? <laughs> Somebody's going to be competing with you. Someone's going to be trying to kick your butt. There's no just easy business that anybody can do. There's, if it was easy, everybody would have huge businesses, and we'd all be retired and having this convention on a boat somewhere. <laughs> but you've got to do the work. You've got to be prepared. When you, walk, when you start a business, when you walk into a room, you have to know more about that business, that industry, than anybody in the world. Because if it's not you, that other person is there to compete with you. And so when you're young, that's the time. Like Damon was saying, the power of broke. Because what have you got to lose? You're going to go back to your dorm room? Oh, that, you know. I mean, I, I, I live six guys in a three-bedroom apartment. If I started a business, you know, what was the downsize? I'd have seven guys in the three-bedroom apartment. <laughs> you know, what have you got to lose? So when you have nothing to lose, go for it. But if you want to be successful regardless of age, realize it's real world. There's competition. You've got to be prepared. You've got to know your business better than anybody. And you've got to be willing to grind 
because that road to success is never a straight line. It's always up and down. There's always issues. There's always problems. There's always someone trying to kick your ass. But if you do the work, if you're prepared, and you realize that it may not happen overnight, but if you keep on grinding, good things happen. Very nice. Mark? Now we're going to ask the Sharks a question that hopefully will reach the audience that we have outside of this room, and that is, um, you're here today to support young emerging entrepreneurs. Why are you committed to supporting young people, and why should others invest in our youth and their journey through entrepreneurship? Can I answer first? Mark? Okay, I'll go first. Um, mm -hmm. you, you know, we, we all want to change the world. Um, and if we're not changing the world ourselves, we want to invest in people who are changing the world. I think millennials today have a little bit of different approach to business than maybe when we got started, because as we see here, there's a little bit more of a social consciousness. But you know, I, I, I have a saying, and that saying is, we don't live in the world we were born into. If you think, those of you who are more than 20 years old, the internet wasn't a thing when you were born. And people today are going to be creating all those things that we didn't imagine could ever happen. Whether they're here, whether we haven't met them yet, all the biggest wonders of our lives in the future and our children's lives and their children's lives have not been invented yet. And the only way for those inventions to happen, the only way for those amazing things to happen is for us to invest in them. And so people have invested in us. We all started with nothing. People saw, saw something in us. I like to look for those things in other people. And hopefully, you know, the reason I do Shark Tank isn't because I want to make more money, even though that's always a little bit of a motivation. It's because I want to help other people live the American dream. I want to be part of that thing that changes everything. And you have to invest in order to do that. Beautiful. Barbara? Mm -hmm. You know, I think the very practical, real side uh, of why it's so satisfying to be part of the Shark Tank show and, and discover people and talent and build it is because of the practical applications. You can make a buck if you're lucky. You lose a lot of money when you're not. Um, but you can really see that people can create jobs, make a real difference in the economy, which supports the life and the bloodline of what we all do, it creates jobs. I mean, all the practical reasons. But secretly, the real reason I like it is it's probably as close as you ever get when you're building a business and helping other people build theirs to doing real magic. You actually feel pretty powerful in a godlike way. <laughs> no, I'm not trying to overestimate that. I feel, well. <laughs> but let me explain nice. why. Because you can see these kids come up and just have a dream, and then two years later, you see that they've hired their best friend, their parents are proud of them, they're making money, they're creating jobs, they're donating to charity, they're dreaming bigger, they're making mistakes, they're getting back up, it's probably the best movie in town. And you get to be part of it. What's wrong with that? That's the fun part. Damon. Uh, you know, I, I think that um, I think that America has always been known for being a place where they said the, the streets were paved with gold. And I think that that's true. I think that, uh, you know, America's number one export and America's number one brand is opportunity. And um, it is paid with gold because it's, there's many places in this world that opportunity does not exist. And I think that when people have no hope and no faith and, and, and nothing to live for, then they have nothing to lose. And then they turn to be the, the people that are challenging in this world when, uh, you know, as the president said last week in My Brother's Keeper, he said, you shouldn't look at a lot of these individuals as challenges. You should look at them as assets as people who are going to employ people and be a father and a mother in a community and, uh, and, and pay taxes and, uh, and help us. So I just think that you know, opportunity in hope and faith are the, are, the, are the right of every individual. And if we are able to empower them with entrepreneurship and then they empower the future, we all benefit off of it. And even my experience from uh, from creating FUBU, I have probably, in my neighborhood alone, have hired more than, just in my neighborhood, 80, 80 individuals over the course of my life who went on now to run their own companies. And that just started with a couple of hats in a bag. And I think that that's what all of us are trying to do all around the world. And, uh, and it, it's just amazing. And again, it's, it's empowering. And, and so I'm happy and very proud to be an entrepreneur. And my last, yes, let's do that first. 
Now, starting again with uh, Damon, you know, you talked about your mom, your relationship, everything that you've been through, the power of broke. Um, there must be something that you felt you would like to go back in time and tell yourself when you were 15 years old. There must be something that if you could have done something a little differently that you would go back and make that fix and talk to yourself. If you were, if you could see that young Damon at 15, what would you say to him today? Mm, if I saw a young Damon at 15, I think we kind of have echoed it up, up here. Um, just a couple of things. I think I would have, I would have told myself to get some form of financial intelligence, and today it would be digital, uh, you know, uh, digital intelligence or education because the way time to change it. Because I, I could have, and I could have been like one of the lotto winners who kind of, who kind of had made it and then wasn't able to actually utilize it the right way. And then also, um, you know, that I wish I would have told myself that money, you know, the the old saying that I love to say that. You know, money is a money is a great slave, but a horrible master. And that when people think that they're going into entrepreneurship and doing things purely due to the fact that I'm going to be rich, I'm going to be that, that it's it's nothing like that. You know, as an entrepreneur, we all know that we're the first at the office and the last to leave, and uh, we thank everybody for our success, and we blame only one person for our failure ourselves. And people who's who's who think that being an entrepreneur is, I'm the boss, I'm gonna to point to everybody, tell you to go get me coffee and a bagel. That's not what it is. You have to do every single thing and it's purely hard work. And at 15, I didn't know that, but at 25, I learned that. And that's when I created my business. Very good. If you could see young Barbara, to, well, she still is. <laughs> That's right. That was a slip. Get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so far. <laughs> what would you say to yourself at 15? Last year. <laughs> <laughs> Two years ago. Don't lie, Barbara. Stay a while. <laughs> um, you know, of the eight most successful businesses that I've invested in, I know those eight very well. I work with them every day. Um, the one thing they have in common, each and every one of those entrepreneurs, without exception, is they were all terrible at school. So if I could go back to that dumb kid in class who couldn't read or write till I was in fifth grade, I would have gone back in second grade and said to myself, don't worry about it. <laughs> you're going to grow up, and you're going to get really street smart, <laughs> and you're going to hustle your way and bullcrap your way. <gasps> I'm OK, I'm OK. I promised my boss, Clay Newbill, I wouldn't curse. <laughs> anyway, I would have told myself to give myself a break, that there's book smarts and street smarts and smarts on your feet really fast. And all of those are far more valuable in life than what you get out of the classroom if you're going to start your business. Except you, because you're really smart, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I would have told myself. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. And last, to conclude our, our uh, panel's remarks here, Mark? I would just say, don't screw it up. <laughs> um, but, but seriously, um, you know, when you're young, we always think we have to know what our future is. You know, this is going to be my career. Literally, my mom was so concerned about my future career that she had somebody teach me how to cut and lay carpet because she didn't know if this business thing was going to work out. Um, and so I, I would stress about those things. And you know, we, we worry when we're in, in high school, what are we going to be? You don't have to know. We worry about when we're in college, where are we going to get that job? We're 22. Golly, we're going to be 22. You, don't worry about it. Right? What, what I tell myself differently is that it's OK to screw up. It's OK to try different things, because you just never know. I didn't take computers in school, yet when I started doing them right out of school, that's when I found what I love. Try as many different things. I would tell my younger self, try as many different things as you can until you find something you love to do. And when you find something you love to do, it's a lot easier to try to be good at it. Ladies and gentlemen, as the president has, yes, first give him the applause, yes. <laughs> as the president has stated that entrepreneurship is one of the most important forces the world has ever known to lift people out of poverty Indeed, we can change the world and change people's arc of their life and transform their future. Give it up for this incredible panel, both our presenters and our sharks. Thank you so much.